Hear me? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Okay. It's strange when you're holding a mic. Um, I've been a public speaker for a while and I'm used to using wireless ones, so you know when the hand gets tied up, it's a bit strange. So bear with me if I accidentally do that. All right? Okay. Um, you're going to get a hell of a story tonight because I'm the oldest of the three. Yeah, I'm probably old enough to be both ladies' fathers. And uh, my life has been nothing but fuck ups. But the great thing about having a long life of fuck ups is halfway through, you start learning from your fuck ups. And then you continue learning from other people's fuck ups. Right? Because you get wiser. Um, the title you see here, I Failed to Succeed, this is actually a three hour presentation. Okay? So when um, I was asked to do this talk, and, it was, and I went to do a bit of research, and I, it's all about fuck-ups, I decided, okay, I need to cut back these three hours into like 15 minutes, right? And just focus on the fuck-ups. I think you guys are going to have fun with this one. Um, my life has always, not always been a bed of roses. In fact, if you, to be perfectly honest, right, it's only uh, started um, 2007 onwards, right? So from my birth, 1964, until 2007, it's been hell. Um, I started out in the film industry after my national service. Um, I dropped out of um, O levels, right? I finished my O levels. I didn't finish my O levels actually. I didn't have a full O level, so, but back in the 1980s, you could drop out and survive, right? So I dropped out and um, started my career in the film industry after my national service as a grunt, sweeping the floor, mopping the studios, making coffee for clients. Seriously, um, that began my journey of fuck ups, and most of my fuck ups, if not all of my fuck ups, have been financial fuck ups. Dropping out of school wasn't the best idea, right? Because the rest of my life, I didn't know anything about finance or economics, running a business, yet I pursued that kind of career. After five years of sweeping the floor and mopping the studios, I learned every job in the industry, uh, literally every job from sound recording to, to camera assistant to Foley to engineer, uh, sound engineering, the works, right? Even editing and all that, and um, eventually became a producer. Um, between 1990 and 1993, I was actually Singapore's top producer. I can claim that because I still hold the record for three of the most expensive productions ever made, right? TV, uh, TV commercial productions. And uh, things were going great, and I was headhunted, and I ended up working for one of the more significant production houses at that time. Won't mention names, but the boss cheated me. Left me high and dry in Australia with a half a million dollar Australian dollar bill to settle, right? Now, I was just an employee, you know? And um, that wasn't my problem. But I was stuck in Australia, and the Australians took my passport and said, you're not leaving until you pay us back, right? I'm the producer, of course, I'm re responsible for that. So um, foolishly, because of my financial ignorance, I, I needed to get back home because my wife was pregnant with my first child. So I pulled out all my credit cards and paid up as much as I could. Couldn't pay a lot, you know, paid about slightly less than half. And I told them, if you keep me here in Australia, I can't go home and find the culprit who actually screwed all of us. Right? So they gave me back my passport, took whatever money I, I gave them, and I came back to Singapore and the boss was gone. So here I am in the hole, um, a hole which um, I created but it was not my fault. And uh, actually that story has a nice ending, I'll come to that later. So I, I started working hard again as a freelancer and um, after a couple of years later I was headhunted one more time and I ended up working for Ken Air, Ken Air Leisure Group. Right? They had become so big that they had actually diversified their media department into a, a, a department on its own. I became the general manager for that, and uh, we were ahead, way ahead of our time. Right? Um, the, one of the departments in the media department was known as the Spy. Right? And the Spy was actually the very first e-commerce website for travel. In fact, we bought the name e-travel. Right? And we were developing online booking facilities and um, uh, even hotels, you know, uh, hotels, cruises, airlines. Uh, it was way ahead of its time because back then, if you wanted to book, you had to like, you know, spend two hours on the internet. You remember it was dial-up? Yeah, it wasn't broadband. You, you remember dial-up? <laughs> yeah, it takes forever to make a booking. So um, that, that kind of failed because of the Asian financial crisis. So Ken Air closed down, so I had to retrench everybody, then eventually retrench myself. and. Um, what was the financial fuck up here? Um, I was doing very well. I had a corner office with a nice big window and nice view and everything. I was, I was getting like a $75,000 salary uh, a year. And um, I was spending like nobody's business, right? Uh, I was really racking up the bills. And then uh, and everything 
went belly up, I didn't have any savings and my wife was pregnant with my first child, which is why I only have two children. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I have a child, something goes wrong. So last time, the next... <laughs> so the next one was a dog, right? <laughs> Big mistake, big mistake, all right? So I, I worked very hard again, and in the end, I decided, you know, I looked, I looked down the, the food chain, and I was thinking, you know, I'm always at the bottom of the food chain, getting screwed, and um, if I'm at the top, I won't get screwed. So who's at the top? You know, you got to be the boss. And the boss of what? Because the, the media food chain is huge, you know? So I was looking at, you know, being a client. No, client has clients. So who is the top guy who doesn't get screwed? And that happens to be the media owner. If you're the media owner, you screw everyone. So I, I thought, okay, I want to be a media owner. And at that time, there were opportunities, right? I was the guy who actually was responsible for starting up all these, like, what? We, uh, let me go back a bit. 1998, our government banned billboards, okay? So they had to take down all these billboards and their rusted lights and everything. So I, I came up with this great idea. I went to Vietnam and brought back new technology, which was light boxes. And then one year later, digital light boxes, right? So I started mounting these things all over the place. I start, started putting up my light boxes at bus stops and all that. Yeah, you're looking at the man, okay? And then um, one by one, these uh, media owners came up and wanted to buy the stuff, right? Pearl and Dean, MediaTek and all that. And I told them, get lost, okay? Stupid. If you want to start a business, let me give you the best advice. You start a business because you want to sell it, right? Being a trader today, everything that you buy, you should sell, okay? <laughs> And they were offering an obscene amount of money for these things. And I, I said, go to hell, you know, <laughs> suck my toes. And um, <laughs> the year is 2000. Recession starts rolling in. And I don't know, you know, head or tail about a recession. I don't know anything about economics. And my cash flow was really healthy. I, no, sorry, my, pay, my books were really healthy, but my cash flow really sucked, right? Because um, like you, I did everything myself, OK? So on paper, I'm thinking, oh, I'm rich, you know, but my bank account is not. And before you know it, one by one, these companies start closing down. And then it's your turn. You start chasing for all the money that's owed to you and you find out that these companies have closed down. There's no money to collect. So very soon, people are chasing you for money. And it became an absolute nightmare. The dog that I bought, I, I feared for its life. Because I had heard, you know, horror stories of people coming and threatening you, you know, you owe me money, they'll put poison under your door, lick it through under your door, and your dog will lick it and die a horrible death. So I shipped my dog to my aunties, you know, this, and I, I used to park my car two car parks away and just sneak home after midnight, right? I will not leave my office as long as the sun was out, and I would get to my office before the sun came up, because I just, and I'll park far away and I'll sneak in by the back door and stuff like that. Life became an awful mess. I would close all my windows, you know, draw the curtains and just turn off the lights and just live in the dark because I didn't want anyone to know I was home. It was horrible. I dare not go to the mailbox because that's where they usually wait for you. Right? So it became an awful, uh, awful mess. And eventually, um, I couldn't hide from the inevitability of bankruptcy. So I did become bankrupt, right, um, to an obscene amount of money. And uh, it was, you think that's the worst part of the nightmare? No, it gets worse. It gets worse, right? So I, I took the bankruptcy and I decided, okay, you know, fine, now I got bankruptcy protection. These people come, come and bother me because it's illegal, right? You come and bother me, I'll report you to the police. I thought I was all, you know, mighty and everything. But it was traumatic. What you don't see when you talk to a bankrupt is the trauma that the bankrupt, bankrupt um, the insolvent went through. You want to take your life, seriously, and I, I almost did, right, several times. The only thing that kept me alive were my two small little kids, right? And um, I looked into the eyes and I said, I owe them a living. I literally do. And uh, I needed to do something about my life. I needed to turn it around. And all my life, it's been about financial fuck-ups. What kind of father am I going to be when my children grow up? Who am I to tell them, you better work hard, save, and you know, they'll tell me, go to hell, Dad. Look at you. I needed to wake up. So I decided, I would do something about my financial illiteracy, right? I reinvented myself as a video producer. Now the film industry was dead. So I had to reinvent myself in the digital, digital age, relearn everything again. I had to struggle with Photoshop and uh, 
page maker and you know, premiere and stuff like that, After Effects. It was brand new to me. Here I am, 30 plus years old and I'm struggling with something that you know, a kid is learning. And uh, well, it, it, was, uh, it was worthwhile because you know, like Steve Jobs says, everything that happens to us are little dots in your past that lead to the future. You don't know where the dots are leading you, but I can tell you where it's led me. I'm using all these skills today. Right? You talk about the digital age, uh, I've got half of that covered. <laughs> right? Being in the media industry and, and knowing how to do all these things. So I reinvented myself as a video producer and something happened during that time. Online trading came to Singapore in a big way. And I was thinking, well, you know, this, this would be good. You know, I can learn how to trade and then I can make some money and you know, I can get out of bankruptcy. And all these people were doubt, touting, you know, get rich quick, financial freedom, you know, millionaire. And I was like, yeah, 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 let's do it, right? <laughs> Here's a, here's a story of retribution for you, okay? Really, karma, right? For 22 years of my life in the media industry, my job was to create lies and then embellish those lies and make it really sexy and attractive so that you would buy something. I fell for those lies, right? Millionaire, yeah, let's do it. Financial freedom, yeah, let's sign up. And then, you know, the nightmare became worse, right? I lost 25,000 US dollars just to the market like that. Boom, gone. Now this is not my money, I'm bankrupt. This is my wife's money. <laughs> she funded the whole venture and I was losing it. My account dwindled down to less than 2,000 bucks and I was like, better don't tell her. Right? Another financial fuck up. So I looked at that fuck up and that's when my life started to change. I looked at it and said, you know, all my life I've been screwing up. And the main reason I'm screwing up is because I'm not learning these things. I'm just taking it, you know, in my younger days, I used to be a surfer and you know, surfers are really callous and you know, fancy free and everything. So that's how I lived my life as a businessman. So this time I decided, no, I really need to learn. I really need to do something about this and educate myself, right? Now, I went from school to school, presented my half-baked O-level certificate, which I did triple science. Actually, I wasn't an idiot, you know, I, I did triple science, I scored distinctions across the board, but I failed both my languages, so I dropped out, right? Every school I went to, they said, sorry, Mr. Lim, you don't qualify for our finance or economics course, right? You did triple science, plus you are a failure. <laughs> so every formal school I went to rejected me, right? And I couldn't find a way to educate myself. And it got frustrating. Now, this is where Adam Koo, a very good friend of mine, comes into play. He's a double honours graduate from anywhere, so finance and economics, and he, he saw my plight. Now, I knew Adam because I knew his father, and uh, you all know who Adam Koo is, right? Yeah? I knew his father. His father was a very good client of mine. Even through my bankruptcy days, he kept the money coming, right? So uh, Adam wanted to start up his school with kids' programs. He wanted to do a video, and that's how I got introduced to him uh, via his father. And so he, he lent me all his books, and he started teaching me a bit about finance economics because I was interested in the stuff. And one thing led to another super long story cut short. I decided to do something about it, right? Really, really do something about it. Over here, this dot, yellow dot you see is the changing point in my life. And I tell you how it changed, how it came about. I watched a movie and it was called The Pursuit of Happiness. Now, I'm sorry that the, the picture is so blurred because I actually scanned this from the pirated video that I bought. <laughs> right? At that time, no money to buy the real thing, so I went to Johor and bought the pirated stuff. So the, some, of the, some of the pictures, you know, are screen caps from the pirated movie, right? So um, in this particular movie, there was one scene that caught me, right? And it was this scene where Will Smith is playing the role of uh, Chris Gardner, who in, is a real-life uh, uh, stockbroker, right? And uh, in this scene, he's walking in front of the exchange. He walks past this, this guy who's a Wall Street, you know, trader. And this, this fellow just parked his Ferrari illegally on the side of the road. He hops out of his Ferrari and then he says, you see his fingers are like that, right? He says, dude, I only got two things to ask you. What do you do and how do you do it? And that's exactly what I wanted to know. So I went around, asked Adam, asked his friends, asked all these people, like, hey, what do you do and how do you do it? He says, don't bother me, right? If you really want to learn this stuff, you got to go to the States because every other teacher down here only knows what they see on their keyboard, right? You really want to learn from a Wall Street trader, you got to learn from a Wall Street trader, right? So, okay, long story cut short, I made my way to the United States and learned from the best. And these are some of the leading people in terms of finance, economics, trading and investing that I ever met, including this gentleman by the name of David Kaplow. David Kaplow was a Harvard uh, lecturer for about 25 years. He 
came to Singapore at my invitation, stayed here during, and he ran away from the subprime crisis. Yeah, so everything came here for about three, four years, and got some teaching assignments here with my help. And uh, a few, uh, I wouldn't go name dropping, but these are some of the best people in the business. Right? They are like a who's who. I mean, some of you watch CNBC, you will recognize this guy. His name is John Nigerian. Superb options trader. So I learned all these things, not just about trading, investing, but I also learned about finance, I learned about economics, right? And when I came back, my whole life had changed. I had learned all these things not to get a degree, but to make myself financially savvier. Because I know moving forward, finance is everything. Whatever business you get into, you better have your finance knocked down. Whatever business you're getting into, whatever entrepreneurship you're getting into, you better know your economics. You can start the worst business at the right time and it will be successful. Or you can start the best business at the wrong time, it will still fail. So it's all about timing. So I came back, started teaching, trading and doing a whole bunch of other things. Long story cut short again, uh, it's not just money made from trading, not just money made from teaching, but it's money made from a whole bunch of other things like selling my products, selling uh, 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 my, my books and stuff like that. And um, I paid off my debt. There you go. That's my proof. And being a dropout, ladies and gentlemen, this is the only certificate I have. <laughs> I am damn proud of this because most certificates like your degree or diplomas don't say much about your money making abilities. Just tells you you're smart, can pass exam. But my cert, to qualify for this exam, you must have no money. <laughs> And for you to be certified proves that you have made money and my accounts will my accounts were audited by the Ministry of Law. How about that? Yeah? <laughs> so so having done that, I pursued more knowledge right, by learning from other people's fuck ups, right? Now, here's a here's a little nice ending to this story. Who was to know back then, back in 2005, that the inspiration that drove me to change my life would become a reality? and I shared the stage with the man. And it's one of the proudest moments of my life. Now that I'm talking to you about it, my hair is standing. Right? Chris Gardner, the guy who changed my life. And um, until today, you know, um, not that we keep in touch uh, frequently, but once in a while, we just you know, pop an email to each other and we ask about my son. He's met my son and all that. So, um, yeah. Wonderful guy. Really wonderful man. Now, it's all about knowing the right people, about not just knowing the right people, but when you know the right people, how do you use them? Now, I'm not using the word use them in a bad way, but how do you take advantage of the situation to maximize the experience, right? Meeting people like Chris Gardner, Ron Ionary, John Nigerian, and all those people, you can shake hands with them and then you can talk to them, hey, what do you have for lunch? You're not going to go anywhere with that, right? You got to ask them things that matter. You got to, you know, uh, really network and, and just talk to them, get into their minds, and ask them the one most important question: Have you ever, ever had fuck ups in your life? And you learn from them. You learn from their fuck ups. What I learned from Chris Gardner is how he fucked up, and you all know his story. It's amazing, right? He and I had this little debate, you know, when he was in, when he was here in Singapore. He, said, he came to me and says, you know, I really admire you, Conrad, for what you've done, you know, getting to bankruptcy and then getting yourself up and becoming successful and all that. I look at him, I say, what are you talking about? You're Chris Gardner. I really admire you for sleeping in the bloody toilet, right, with your son and being able to do something about your life. He says, no, no, no. In America, it's okay to be homeless. It's not so difficult. But in America, getting bankrupt is very tough, right? I say, oh, in Singapore, it's the other way around. Being homeless is tough. Being bankrupt, not so bad. <laughs> So you're only as good as the company you mix with. You know, if I was to ask you, you know, who are the, the three or five people that you mix most of the time with, right? You know, whether your shopping buddies, your football buddies and all that. Most of you will agree that you're not better than these people and these people are not better than you. That's why you call them your peers. Now, I'm not saying that you just should discard your peers, right? They're your fun time friends, but you need another group of people. People who are hungry, people who want to succeed, people who are determined. And that's why I teach today, because by teaching my network grows and these people all have that same mindset. They're hungry, they want to grow, right? They are determined to make their lives better. And that motivates me. We'll talk about motivation in a minute. So you're only as good as the company that you mix with. And today I mix with all sorts. I mix with people who have established themselves, people who are hungry to establish themselves, and people who are really great influencers, right? 
Some of you will recognize their faces. These are kids from uh, SIM, and they're all looking, look at, the, look at their faces, right? It only says one thing, why your hair so long? <laughs> no, I mean, you can see the hunger in their faces, and they all want to survive. They want to succeed, not just survive. So this is one great platform for you to network, okay? Now, let me give you a little bit more advice. You know, stuff that I've learned from my own screw-ups and how I was able to stay on the straight and narrow and not screw up again, right? Well, one thing is you learn from other screw-ups and take that seriously. If other people have screwed up before, learn it. Don't say, it won't happen to me. Don't say, oh, you're stupid, I'm smarter than you. The moment you start talking like that, you're not humble anymore. And the moment you're humble, uh, you're not humble, you can only be complacent. And that's when failures happen, right? Another way not to fail is to not succeed. Yeah, if you call me successful, I say, no, 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 I'm not successful. I'm just making one achievement after the other, right? I never ever want to succeed again. Because every time I succeeded, I went down. So if I never want to go down again, I don't, I'm not going to call myself uh, self successful. I'm just an achiever, right? And I'm able to do so because of this thing called a dream board. Now, I have, you know, gone through already. Now I'm on my third dream board. This was the one that got me out of bankruptcy. This is something that you can do for yourself. And it actually works. You're looking at somebody who has done it. And I have a few of my students here in the crowd who are also doing it, right? All you do is you take a big piece of margin paper and you just write a few things on it, stick a few dreams on it, right? For example, I had this cage with the butterflies busting out of it, right? That was me. That was representing my break out to freedom, you know, away from financial jail. And then I, I put a whole bunch of things like, you know, a cup with diamonds pour, pouring out of it. I put some inspirational faces there. And then I got some of these notes, you know, that some of my students wrote to me and to inspire me. And this was before my discharge from bankruptcy, right? They said, you know, Conrad, just keep pressing on, you'll make it. All, all these inspirational things from friends, right? And then um, at the bottom there, I had a few goals planned out, right? One, this one, this house where you see a lot of hands coming out from the computer, that was representative of me wanting to multitask and do multiple streams of income from the comfort of my home. Guess what? I achieved it, right? Over here, some gold bars, I didn't achieve that, but you know, I got small eight ounce ones now, <laughs> yeah? So in a way, sometimes you dream about these things, but you don't achieve it, but you make some level of success. You know, and small eight ounce gold bars are good enough, right? And then you see this car here, that's the BMW X5. This was back in 2007. I was dreaming about having this SUV, right? And um, I went for the test drive and I was actually invited to the test drive and I, I was not impressed with the car. So in the end, I bought something that looked similar. I bought the Suzuki Vitara. <laughs> yeah? So at least, at least you do get some progress in that sense, right? And then, of course, you know, I, I'm grateful and blessed. I, you know, I'm always thankful for the things that I have. I'm not, you know, bitter about the things that I'm denied or things that I don't have. This is the only thing that eludes me so far, right? Well, eventually, eventually, okay, I do have a toy model of that, right? Now, the house by the beach, I don't really have a house by the beach, but I do live in Badot Reservoir, <laughs> right? So it oversees this beautiful reservoir, right? Then, you know, I, I, I wrote this, you know, I intend to continue sharing what I've learned, you know, in my life and, and just take it one lesson at a time and to make people happier, make people smile. Now, the, the whole process of making people smile is not a literal thing, right? But to change people's lives for the better, one life at a time. And this is why I continue to teach today, because I truly believe you want to make a difference, you teach, right? And these are some of the thank you notes that motivated me. So if, if you really want to move forward, you know, you do one of these dream boards, stick it up on the wall where you sleep, right? This is the last thing you see when you go to sleep and the first thing you see when you wake up. Visually, it will influence you, right? Um, it's called um, visualization, okay? Other motivational factors that you can do? This is what I do to make myself achieve and achieve and achieve and achieve. Even on a dull day where there's nothing to be done, there is something more that you can do just to make it a better day than yesterday. So I always ask myself these two questions. What must I do today to make it better than yesterday? And while I'm in today, I'm asking myself already, what am I prepared to do to make tomorrow better? And this is something that I live by. You might be thinking, wow, Conrad, that's tough, that's impossible. Well, impossible doesn't exist in my language. Back in my film days, I had a very good teacher who taught me something which stuck in my head until today. Nothing is impossible given the right attitude and the right motivation. And sometimes, the right budget. And really, it has, it has worked for me, right? Nothing is impossible. You just have to have the right attitude and the right uh, uh, 
motivation for it. So, good things come to those who wait. That's if you like waiting for nothing in the meantime. I don't believe in waiting for nothing. I work, right? If somebody was to ask me, Conrad, you're so successful, I, I'll tell you, you know, from where I'm standing, success looks like a lot of hard work to me. And it still continues to be hard work. Nothing comes easy. And if you don't want to work for it, then don't dream about it, right? Otherwise, just press on, just keep pressing on and just achieve one thing at a time, right? Great things come to those who work their asses off without giving up their values, without losing sight of their values. You can, you can be successful, but there are two ways to be successful, ethically and unethically, morally and, un, uh, you know, well, with evil. But I choose to do things the right way. So as long as it's ethically and mor morally correct, I will press on. Failure is not the end, never is, right? From my story, you can see failure just starts a new chapter and my chapter always bounces higher. I may have taken a beating down, yes, but you can see that every bounce went higher. So this is from my book, the book that I, I debuted about three years ago, right? The results may not be exactly what you expected, but any result is an achievement in the right direction. It's a small measure of success. The results may sometimes be a failed attempt, but a failure is only complete when you give up, when you quit. If we persist and continue to get results, then failure is nothing more than a learning lesson to make us wiser, stronger. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. This makes any success thereafter all the more sweeter to savor. And I live by these things, you know? Don't worry, finishing soon. So these are the, the, some of the mantras that I live by, right? I never want to be deemed as successful, right? I'm an achiever and I keep achieving small success at a time. Because the day I say I've arrived is the day I'm truly lost. And the day I say I'm successful is the day I failed. So I never want to be successful. I've been successful before. I don't like it because it always is followed by failure. And this is why, the main reason why I continue to teach and change people's lives today. People think immortality is about living forever. I have a different take on this. Immortality is what you've done in your lifetime so that you are never forgotten. And I never want to be forgotten. I want to be remembered for the things that I've done, the great things that I've done for people, right? Those, even those who don't sign up for my class when they become my students, I'm changing their lives. Backups are coming to me, insolvents are coming to me with their problems, and I, I do whatever I can to talk to them and motivate them and help them out, yeah? And these are the little things that you should think about doing, and not just focusing on your business, not just focusing on your entrepreneurship. You want to be successful? Help. Do it for free. And when you do that, you're doing good deeds, you're paying it forward. And I truly really believe in that because karma is a bitch, I tell you. When she comes knocking and you haven't done your good deeds, she can be a real downright bitch. So, <laughs> the journey still carries on and um, that's my life story. So after that major failure, today I'm an author, trader, entrepreneur, teacher, intellectual property owner, counsellor, consultant, analyst, economist, columnist, investor, and a multi-millionaire in just two years after my discharge. So, that's me, book launch, you know, famous and everything. It's nice to dream about such things. So I've had best-selling books. I also have very hot selling items on the internet. So yes, I'm into e-commerce as well. And I do agree with you, Joel. E-commerce is a real bitch, right? And um, I still do what I do best because somebody once told me, in order to do something well and something successful, do what you love. When you do what you love, then find a way to monetize it and continue to do what you love. And that's what I do today, right? I'm invited to conferences and talks like these things, you know. I, I do tutorials, tutelages, lectures and seminars. And today I even teach. I even teach at institutional level. Not bad for an O-level dropout, huh? Yeah? And this is what I do best from the comfort of my home. Yeah, the two things that I love the most. So, in parting, let me share with you this story. Success. You can dream about it, but it only comes to those who work at it the hardest and believe in it the longest. And as long as you keep pressing on, as long as you keep sight of your values, as long as you keep sight of your goals, you're going to come across fuck-ups ever so often. Ride the wave. As an ex-surfer, I've had many fallouts, right? I've had many wipeouts. I've hurt myself, I've broken bones and stuff like that. But hell, you get back on the bone and you ride it again. And that's what life is all about. It's going to knock you back down. 
But every time you get knocked down, get back up again. The moment you decide to stay down, you've lost. I don't want to call you names like quitter, loser, whatever, you know, but get back up and don't waste time. Get straight back up, right? I like what Stallone said, you know, it's not about how hard you can hit, but how hard you can take a hit and how many times you can take that hit and still keep coming back. That's a real fighting spirit. So that's my message to all of you. I hope that it was something inspirational. I hope it was something that you will take home and, you know, probably think about it. And if any of you want to follow my postings and all that, well, my website's not difficult to follow, right? ConradAlvinLim.com. Yeah, I got a Facebook page and all that. Please come aboard, have a read through. Every Friday, I post motivational messages there, right? So my students get motivated, they don't give up. Because the financial markets can be, a, can be quite held sometimes. And it just takes a little bit of motivation just to keep you moving. Yeah, that's all it takes, a bit of motivation. Thank you for having me tonight and thank you for letting me overrun. I hope it was fine. Did you have fun? Thank you very much.